is a pleasure to be with you and to share in such an opportunity to exchange the struggles that we are all facing. Uh, as you have heard from Professor Tim Westmoreland and probably already know, for decades, the United States healthcare system has been sorely troubled. From the 1980s, the numbers of our people without health insurance increased steadily until we now have today nearly 50 million people, one in six Americans without health insurance. And we know that without health insurance, they get less care, they get care too late, and they are, as a result, more likely to die than people who have health insurance. At the same time, our health care costs have steadily increased and, and relative to the size of our economy, growing faster than our economy. And as uh, Tim said, we now spend more than twice per capita what the average spent by other industrialized nations on health care without any evidence that we have any superiority in quality of care. Now, when we talk in the U.S. about the fragmentation of our healthcare system, and you heard how many different systems and private insurers, public insurers that we have, it is sometimes treated as if it were an accident, as if it somehow just happened in the U.S. But as we are discussing here, the nature of our healthcare system is the result of public policy and political choices made over decades. Decades. After fa the failure of multiple in, uh, attempts over the course of the 20th century to enact government-sponsored national health insurance, private insurance through employment became the primary system for insurance coverage in our country. But public, the public protection that we have built around that employer-sponsored insurance system for the elderly and disabled eligible for our retirement benefits and for some low-income people who were not expected to work, namely very poor, poor children, the disabled, and pregnant women. But both public and private insurance excluded low-wage workers, to let, getting too low wages to get coverage through their jobs, and in the public system, not fitting into any of these categories. So low-wage adults uh, constitute the bulk of our uninsured, most of them working, but in jobs that do not offer health insurance. As Tim said, we've begun to fix this with the enactment of Obamacare. Of Obamacare. But despite the political controversy that we still face uh, in implementing this law, I will tell you, as Tim did, this is a very modest law. The Affordable Care Act dramatically expands our insurance coverage, making a big dent in covering the 50 million people now left out, but continues to rely heavily on private insurance for coverage. Our early investment in employer-sponsored insurance impeded enactment of a common system of universal coverage. As the 85% of people who have health insurance coverage have been frightened that expanding it to reach the other 15% would somehow endanger the coverage they have and make them worse off, not better off. And in the political struggle to expand coverage and enact Obamacare, Addressing these fears led to a, a law that, although it expands coverage, nevertheless leaves most of our existing mechanisms in place. Employer-sponsored insurance is left largely untouched. There is the creation, as Tim described, of new subsidized and regulated private insurance outside employer-sponsored insurance, but only for those who don't get coverage through their jobs. There is a reliance on, our, on states to establish these markets along with the programs for the lowest income populations. That coverage is now extended to everyone below, so below a certain income, regardless of whether they're a child, pregnant, or their family status. And there is no public authority to allocate resources or control costs. That is, no budget 
for our overall health care system. This continued fragmentation of our system raises several problems. The first is risk spreading. Outside large employers, where risk can be readily easily spread, reliance on private insurance leads to competition to avoid risks, to avoid people when they're sick, rather than to deliver efficient, high quality care. In virtually all our populations, old and young, roughly 20% of the people, the sickest population, account for 80% of the costs. And that means that if insurers can avoid those sick, the sick people, they can do very well and make every effort to do so. The result is that sicker people pay higher premiums, get less good coverage, or until the Affordable Care Act, Obamacare, get no coverage at all if they are not covered through their jobs. Risk spreading is the first problem we face. A second problem is accountability. Reliance on markets, on competing insurers to provide health insurance, requires federal oversight that is not readily forthcoming in our political system. Regulation to prevent insurers from selecting, favoring the healthy and avoiding the sick is very hard to accomplish, even in regulated markets. Reliance on state governments to establish the regulatory apparatus leads to tremendous variation across states and weakens federal oversight. And the result is, again, inadequacy of health insurance protection for the people who need it most. And our third problem is costs. Once people are effectively insured, as we talked about the scope of coverage, once we actually limit their out-of-pocket spending, the key to cost containment is how providers are paid, since most costs are incurred, as I said earlier, by the very sick. Private insurers have shown very limited ability to constrain payments, since it's easier for them to avoid paying benefits than to control costs. And in many cases, increasingly in the US, they have very limited market power relative to very strong providers, particularly hospitals and hospital systems. Payment constraints in Obamacare in the Affordable Care Act are largely limited to public programs which can exercise market power because they buy for so many, many millions of people. And under the ACA, the focus in containing costs is not simply on controlling price, though that is a very important part of the job, but also, as was mentioned earlier, on moving away from fee-for-service fee payment, paying more, the more services that are provided, to paying in bundles, contingent on performance standards, as you mentioned, tied to quality of care. But whether that works and whether it extends beyond the public sector to the private insurance remains to be seen. The results are uncertain. The problems that our system experiences may offer some lessons for other nations, just as your experience offers lessons to us. The first lesson I see is that allowing growth in uncontrolled private an uncontrolled private insurance system for some of the population can make it very difficult to develop an adequate system for everybody in the US private coverage for 85% of the population has crowded out the will to provide public coverage for the 15% left out but as I understand happens in many developing nations, development of costly private coverage for even 15% of the population can drive out the willingness and the ability to use a nation's resources to cover the larger population. It is important to be mindful 
that people and providers of health care become very invested in whatever system they become used to and that these investments can impede a movement to more effective policy. Some may think that reliance on private insurance for the better off preserves public financing for the rest. But allowing an expensive system to develop for some may significantly limit the resources and public support for a more equitable system for everybody. A second lesson is that as the comprehensiveness assurance of insurance grows, attention to provider payment is essential. We cannot rely on out-of-pocket payments to limit use if we want people to have real insurance protection. Payment levels and payment incentives will shape all of our health insurance systems. All nations grapple with how to pay in a way that generates efficiently delivered quality care. Not too little, not too much, but just right. But we learn from each other in trying to do that. And finally, markets cannot be counted on to spread risks or to control costs. Insurers will always have an incentive to compete to avoid risk and rules to prevent that kind of competition can never be fully successful. Our experience shows that. Divided market power will never be as effective as government authority in assuring appropriate resource allocation. Government needs to exercise that authority in resource allocation, not simply pass it off to the marketplace, or even worse, to consumers, and just hope for the best. With the enactment and now the implementation of Obamacare, our system is going to improve, but we will continue to struggle to make it efficient and equitable. We have much to learn from others in that process, and we hope that others will learn from our challenges as well as our successes. Thank you.